What it, I mean, it, mm. it, it has had mm. tens yeah. of millions. Hundreds. About 300 million. Views. About 300 million views around the world since uh, we did it. And <coughs> do you know what? It, it, it nearly never happened. I had a bit of a heart scare a few years well, this ago. This is what I've got to say. I mean, what on earth is a man yeah. who had major heart failure... Yes. ..was at one point even on the heart transplant yes, was, waiting yes. list? Yes. What are you doing that for? Well, it, that was taken in my uh, sister's garden. My nephew, uh, oh, obviously no. my sister's <laughs> um, uh, son, uh, said this was a big rave gun around the world. Why don't you try it? And the reason it's worked, Nigel, is because I was immediately dismissive of what it was all about. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tough. Yeah, and I've, I've been trained to take pain and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, you know, I looked so foolish when it happened. But my nephew was so worried at how convulsed I got, he nearly switched the camera off and came and ran over to help me out. Yeah. Thank God he didn't, because uh, that is... You know, part of my lifelong legacy, really. Yes, but a pretty stupid mm. thing to do for a guy that's well, had serious heart trouble. I feel I've known. Uh, I've been offered a lot of money and a lot of opportunities to do it again. And, of course, I won't, because yeah. I realise now how dangerous it could be, you know? 20 years ago, you, yeah. had, you had this terrible heart problem. Yes. Where are you now, health-wise? Um, well, I was on the heart transplant list for about seven months. Yeah. And I realised my life was disappearing. I'd lost a couple of jobs on the radio station I worked on on TalkSport. I was the programme director there and I did the morning breakfast show with Alan Brazil. And it all was disappearing. Can I tell anybody, if you want your career to keep going, don't get ill. Because once you do, you're forgotten about. And, and, and I'm not saying that bitterly or, or you know, with regret, but we, we work in fast-moving environments in this industry, the communications industry, yeah. and if you're not communicating, somebody else has to fill in for you. And they might be better than you or they might be pretty good. You get left behind. It's just life. I'm not bitter about it. I came back and, uh, and I rebuilt the career and now I'm delighted to say I do more in television, sitting yeah. here with you, yeah. and I do in radio. But you've lost weight and you've got yourself... Well, I lost about five stone in the immediate yeah. aftermath of the heart problem, and, and that was one of my problems. I, I was massively overweight. And we led very, very demanding lives. Mr Brazil and I would do a breakfast show from six in the morning till ten in the morning. we then jump this into... Was, I mean, this was the famous talk sport. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And actually, it was quite revolutionary. It was completely revolutionary, because what I would say we did is we introduced what I'd call tabloid radio. Until we got going, nobody had ever thought to go and invite you know, the chief football writer of the Daily Mail onto radio. And we started that. And now, of course, a lot of those guys in Fleet Street have second careers <laughs> as pundits in yeah. radio and television. We started all that. But we would finish a radio show, jump into a car, go up to Newcastle, do a fans forum in the evening with Peter Beardsley and Newcastle fans. That would finish at one in the morning. Then we'd sort of have a couple, you know, to, well, to, to uh, and then get up again at five o'clock and do it all over again. Yeah, and Alan Brazil you work with. I yes. mean, extraordinary character. Uh, most extraordinary man I've ever met. I mean, more energy than I've ever seen in anybody. I mean, I, I, to, to s talk about Al as being indefatigable. Yes. Uh, I think that's the way you pronounce it. And is 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 the description for Al. Nothing's ever stopped him. He's never troubled the scorer with sleep too much, has he, or anything uh, like that? No, no, no. He, I mean, the, the thing with Al, he just goes on. Al lives his own life, and he is a bon vivant. I used to call him a bon viveur until David Ginola corrected me and said, no, no, Michael, it's not bon viveur, it's bon vivant, OK? I said, right, thank you, David. But Al is the absolute bon vivant. Al can have a few drinks all day, go on air, not sound like he's had a drink, come off, have a few more, and then go to sleep <laughs> and then get back on air the full night. I've never, I've never genuinely... 25 years I've worked with Al now, I've genuinely never seen him intoxicated, despite his no. reputation for being a, a guy who and likes a few beers. And sport on the radio, mm. whether it's sports debate... Yes. ..or whether it's the coverage of live sport, mm. Mm. I mean, kind of the BBC letting this all go, aren't they? I mean, well, look, even test cricket, even yeah. test cricket. Yeah. You know, I've been a test match special fan all my life. Exactly. I don't think it's got quite the charm that it used to have. No. And suddenly, a couple of test matches, it's been on TalkSport too. Yeah, exa ex exactly. I mean, the, the, the charming days you were talking about was when the 
people who were doing the punditry and the commentary were part of the show. Yes. You know, I, I yes. mean, people criticise Gary Lineker all the time and say he gets paid an awful lot of money, but it's really, it's on the pitch. And I think that's true. You, you tune into Premier League football to watch the Premier League footballers, whereas Test Match Cricket you're talking about, yes. it was a show, and it was a beautifully rounded show. Yeah. They used to talk about the lady who sent them the cake and what sort of cake it and was. And the bus going down and, the Harleyford Road and whatever it may be. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so that was warm, what I'd call warm broadcasting. Yeah. You felt part of it. It was like putting on an overcoat, you know, on a cold day and all that kind of stuff. But the problem, of course, is that the BBC, as you know better than I do, has moved from being something you've got for £149 a year to a tax that you have to pay. And all the massive international communications corporations can outbid you now on anything, yeah. literally anything. Yeah. I, mean, I, my, I love sport. You know that. I love, yeah. I, I love all sports. Yes. I, I kind of follow them all um, as much as I possibly can. Mm. And I, I must say, if I'm in the car on a Saturday... Yeah. Uh, for 10 months of the year, 9, yeah. 10 months of the yeah. year, and it gets to 5 o'clock, mm. I'm straight on to 5 Live. Absolutely. I'm straight on to 5 Live. Absolutely. You know, James Alexander Gordon well, would have been I your mean, man. Uh, you know, but I loved all of that. Yes. You get the music, you get the football scores, yeah. the two or three teams you're following. Yeah. You know, you know when it is, yes. and the BBC are giving that up. Are they just handing this to commercial radio? No, what they're doing is somebody else has come in. This, is, this happens all the time in broadcasting now. Somebody else has come in, first thing you have to do, I'll make my mark on this show. I'll make my mark on this station. Right. I'll do something revolutionary. And do, do you know what a lot of it is all about? It's about I've got to become relevant. The best way you can become relevant when you're running something that's successful is to do nothing and let it keep going. A lot of organisations now have decided to devote a lot of their time and energy into what they call diversity. And I'm all for diversity because I want to make sure that the people I'm broadcasting to are relevant to what I'm saying. I want to make sure that the people around me yep. feel inclusive with me and understand my uh, method of operating and I understand theirs. I want younger people to come in. I want people from, you know, different origins than mine to be working with and me. To reach a bigger, and to reach a bigger audience. And to reach a bigger audience. But that's the crucial point you've just made. It's no good going through that sort of exercise yeah. if all of a sudden the figures, which have been going like that for years, suddenly start going yeah, like that, yeah. because that's not the object yeah. of the <laughs> exercise. <laughs> Football, you know, Everton man, and, yeah. and you love the game when you've done, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours of commentary on yes, football yes. over the years. I have to say, I was a little bit sceptical yeah. about women's football. Right. Or maybe I was a bit ignorant yeah. about women's football. Yeah. Wasn't that terrific the other week? It was absolutely fantastic, and they definitely crossed the line there into what I would call now a recognised major sport, you know. And also, they managed to overcome a lot of the doubters. Right near the start, 20 years ago, I used to have conversations with people from Coventry and all that about women's football and, and all that kind of stuff, and I was a sceptic. I, I thought yeah. it'd never catch on. However, what I think we have to understand is that men's football and women's football are different games. Yes. They're, they're different games, yes. and, and they're almost different cultures. Because the reason why you get such big crowds at women's finals, largely, 80% of it is, is usually female, is because it's such a wonderful atmosphere. It's, it's such a beautiful place to be. Yeah. It's, it's so embracing to be able to take your children and not feel fear or antagonism, not to hear bad language. Mm. Because whatever you say about men's football... It is based in tribalism, and that tribalism spills over time and time again. To this day, everybody says, oh, we conquered, you know, the hooligan problem. We haven't. We not, haven't. Not at Wembley last July for that Euro uh, final. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, and not when Manchester United's coach turns up at Liverpool, or Liverpool's coach yeah. turns up at Manchester yeah. United. Yeah. There's still, you know, missiles and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So, so women's football... And let's embrace it for what it is and, and the, the success it's brought this country. Yeah. It's a different game to men's football. And yeah. I want it to stay that way because I don't want it to take on all the negatives of men's no, football. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Mike, before you know, doing sport where well, you've done yeah. it, you did other types of journalism, sure. you know, and mm. in Northern Ireland during mm. the trouble and mm. Libya during the bombing and mm. doing mm. some dangerous yeah. frontline stuff. Yeah. Do, you, do you prefer doing the sport to doing that? Well... <laughs> Each has got its merits. I used to say about sport, right, and I had a lot of conversations with the guys who we brought on to talk sport, who were match reporters. Yeah. It's not that challenging to sit in a press box for 90 minutes or two hours 
and report on men kicking a football around. And, and, and I was able to say that because none of the guys I was talking to had actually been in the Al Kabir Hotel in Tripoli when the US Air Force bombed it and smashed the place to bits and you were literally crawling out of the rubble, you know. Yeah. Which is not a very nice thing to be doing at the time. But you look back on it and you think, wow, what an experience. Whether, you know, well, I, I think every football match is basically the same, if you, if you see what I mean. Mm. You know, it, mm. it, it starts mm. at, at one time, it ends 90 minutes later, and, the, and there's yeah. a result. So doing non-football, and I've done World Cups and European Championships, yep. you know, South Africa and Germany and all that kind of stuff, doing non-football is much less predictable. And I think it's the <coughs> lack of predictability in all our lives, and you've been in politics all yeah. your life, that's one of the most unpredictable professions yeah. of all. Yeah. I think that's what keeps no, you I going. I get the point. Yeah. Now, part of your journalistic career, yeah. pre-sport, was one of the most extraordinary and, I suppose, now historic. Yeah. Tragic, but historic moments. Yeah. You were at PA. Yes. It was 1997. Yeah. It was the end of August. August 31. What happened? August 31, I was watching Match of the Day. In fact, that was August 30, because it was Saturday night. Right. And uh, Match of the Day was coming to an end, and I got a call from the office. I was the executive editor of the Press Association. And the first information I got was that Dino had been involved in a car crash in a tunnel in Paris. We already knew that Dodie Fied had sadly died. And the first report said that Dino had a broken collarbone, had been taken from the wreckage, was in hospital... But none of it was adding up to me because there was no official information. I went back into the office immediately. I was very lucky to have a correspondent with Robin Cook in Manila. Can you <clears> believe that? The Press Association, because it's the agency of record, Yes. Uh, the diplomatic correspondent was with Robin Cook. I didn't know, but I do now, that when a member of the royal family dies on foreign soil, the information goes between foreign minister to foreign minister. It does not go between prime minister to prime minister, and it does not go from royal family to royal family. The diplomatic way to do it is foreign minister to foreign minister. My boy was with Robin Cook, the foreign minister. I managed to get hold of him in the early days of mobile phones and to get him to ring me. <clears throat> and I told him everything we knew and said, go back into that room where Robin Cook is. First indication was, he said, funny you should say that, I was on the plane with Robin Cook. We were just about to take off, and the plane was called back to the apron, right. and Mr Cook was taken off the plane. Something had to be going on. After a few more checks and another hour and a few more pieces of the jigsaw, I decided we had enough information to release to the world at 4.41 in the morning, Diana Princess of Wales has died. Extraordinary. 25-year anniversary coming up in a few days' time. Indeed, yeah.